Welcome back. In this video, we're talking about hypothesis testing. We're also going to cover the p-value. We're going to talk about 95% confidence intervals. At the end of this video, I promise you, you're going to understand these concepts perfectly, and this will form the basis for all statistical inference. So buckle up, get ready, and enjoy. Let's just deal with one thing straight out of the gate, and that is the most obvious question, which is what is a hypothesis? And the answer is a hypothesis is a testable theory, something that can be falsified. And let's quickly talk about the context in which hypothesis testing gets used, right? Our starting point is we may have a question about a population. So let's imagine there's a population here, it could be everybody in Ireland, and we've got all of these little people, and we've got some idea about these people. Maybe it's the average weight of men in this population. Now, we can't weigh everybody in Ireland, or we can't weigh all of the men. So what do we do instead? Instead of weighing all of them, we take a sample of men, and assuming that the sample is a random sample, in other words, it's representative of the, of the, of the, of the wider population, we can make inference about the population by looking at the parameters and the characteristics of that sample. Right? And so we, we generate hypotheses and we test those hypotheses with the sample data and we develop a sense and we never know for sure because it is only sample data. Sample data is always subject firstly to things like bias, but we're not going to talk about that in this lesson. But it's always sampled, uh, uh, subject to the fact that it's a random sample and a random sample will, will never be an exact representation of the entire population. Okay, so with that in mind, let's get going. When we talk about hypothesis testing, there's usually two ideas and they're usually mutually exclusive if only one of the two can possibly be true, right? So let's, let me give you an example. Let's say that we've always believed that men in Ireland have an average weight of 65 kilograms, right? Uh, and that's the null hypothesis, but we believe that that's incorrect and we believe that the data will show that that's incorrect. And so we'd like to argue that the average weight is not equal. 65 kilograms. Can you see that only one of these two ideas can possibly be true, right? And what we want to do is we want to use the data to show that one of them is likely to be false. And because of that, we can have confidence that the other is likely to be true. Now, this is where our sample data comes in and the idea of sampling. Let's work with the assumption that the null hypothesis is in fact correct. If that were true, and we took a sample of the population of Ireland, of the men in Ireland, and we weighed them, right? We would, we would find that we wouldn't necessarily get exactly 65 kilograms, right, when we went on, on our first sample, but we're likely to get somewhere close to 65 kilograms. Let's say we got our sample had an average weight of just less than 65. Well, let's imagine that we did that again, right? And the second time around, it was just over 65 kilograms. And we did it again, and the third time it was exactly 65 kilograms. And we kept doing this again and again and again. What would happen was, what would happen would be that most of our samples would be in and around 65. Remember, our assumption at this point in time is that this is in fact correct, right? Our assumption is that the null hypothesis is right, that in actual fact, the average weight of men in Ireland is 65, 65 kilograms. If that were true, most of our samples would be in and around 65. A few of them, by virtue of absolute chance, would be a little bit further away uh, you know, some of them would, would might be 55 kilograms, some of them 75 kilograms, and very few of the samples through absolute random chance would land up having an average weight way down at maybe 50 kilograms and 70, 80 kilograms or 80, 90 kilograms, very few. Okay, so we'd expect most to be in the middle and this is what we call a distribution. And can you see that this distribution has got a bit of a shape here and I'm just gonna draw a line and underneath this line, can you see that it is definitely true that all of the samples fall underneath that line somewhere. So we could say 100% of them, let's put 100% here, 100% land up somewhere beneath that line, right? A smaller percentage would fall in this space over here. Let's say 2.5% for argument's sake. And similarly, a small percent
would fall on the other side of that line, just by virtue of random chance. Now remember, we've done a sample, and we expect, in, in all probability, for the sample that we've taken, if it's the case that the null hypothesis is true, we expect our sample to be somewhere here in the big bundle in the middle. If it were the case that the sample we took landed up right here on the edges where we really know it's very unlikely to, to, to land, we would have less confidence that this assertion that this is in fact the distribution of the samples is in fact correct. In fact, we may have so little confidence that we reject the idea completely and absolutely and we decide that the null, null hypothesis that the average weight uh, is 65 kilograms is in fact in all probability incorrect. And that would mean that we could accept the alternative hypothesis, H1, that the average weight of men in Ireland is in fact not 65 kilograms. Does that make sense to you? And incidentally, we would decide even before taking our sample what the, what the significance level is. In other words, what is the line in the sand? What is the threshold beyond which we consider the sample to be so unlikely that in actual fact we have no confidence that this is in fact the distribution that represents the population? In this case, we've chosen a threshold of 5%, in other words, 2.5% in each tail, right? Because remember here, our alternative hypothesis is that the average weight is simply not 65. It could, it could be in either direction. It could be, you know, the actual, the, the actual population average weight may be above or below 65. If our alternative hypothesis was that the average weight was more than 65, we would just use a one-tailed hypothesis test. Now let's imagine in this particular example, we took a sample from the population and the sample landed up giving us a value that landed over here somewhere. And uh, let's say that that value was 75 kilograms. Okay, and what does that mean? Well, what we would do is we would say that 75 kilograms lands up in a part of the curve for which on either side, because it's a two-tailed test, there's a probability of getting a sample that's that far away from the middle. And if you add those two together, that would be the p-value. So what is the p-value? The p-value is assuming that the null hypothesis is true, right? So this is the distribution of samples that you'd expect. What are the chances? What is the probability that you would get a sample, a random sample from the population that's that far away or further from the middle, right? And it's that far away or further in either direction, right? That's why we color in and basically the area under the curve is the probability. Uh, we, color, we, we, we use the shaded area from that point onwards in both directions. That's your p-value. And provided that your p-value is less than that threshold we talked about, the alpha, right? So, and in this case, that's 5%. So if the p-value in this case was 3% and the alpha value, the, the threshold was 5%, that would be sufficient evidence for us to say we reject the null hypothesis. And we accept the alternative hypothesis. And we've got confidence that in actual fact, the average weight of men in Ireland is not 65 kilograms. And if the p-value was greater than alpha, then we would say that we've failed to reject the null hypothesis and we don't have sufficient evidence to accept the alternative hypothesis. Now, we often use 5% as the alpha or as the threshold level or the significance level. In actual fact, you need to think about what it is that you're measuring and then decide what would be an appropriate threshold. In other words, if it's a life and death thing, if you got it wrong, people would fall off the map and die. Well, you might want to have a much more stringent alpha. You might want to say, in actual fact, we want there to be a one you know, in 10,000 chance that we're wrong. And if it's something a little bit more casual, like the extent to which you can flip a coin and you'll throw a cricket ball and hit a, hit a, hit a TV, it doesn't matter. You might want to say 10%. Is fine. It all depends on what it is that you're measuring. So don't just use 5% as a knee jerk kind of default. Think about what it is that you're measuring and make a decision as to what would be most appropriate given the implications of the data that you're looking at. And finally, when we do these statistical tests, right, we not only discover that this, this particular value that we got in our sample has got, let's say, a p value of, let's say in this case, a p-value of 0.12. But the other thing that we get from the, st the statistical test is a 95% confidence interval. So in this case, it's 75, and we might say... that we are 95% sure that the true 
average weight of men in Ireland falls within a particular range. And uh, in this particular case, we know that that range will not overlap with 65, right? Listen, thanks for watching. I hope you found that useful. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Hit, this, hit the bell notification for, for notification of future videos. Don't ever change, don't do drugs, always do your best. Speak to you soon. Take care, bye.